So welcome back everybody for the last talk of the day. It is our immense pleasure to welcome Doina Prekop. Um, you probably all have heard of Doina, but just in case, Doina is an associate professor at McGill University uh, where she teaches machine learning. She has specialized in reinforcement learning. She's also a SciFAR fellow um, and a member of AAAI. And she also heads the Montreal lab of DeepMind. Um, related to the topic Doina will be covering today, well, her PhD thesis was actually foundational work on the topic of hierarchical reinforcement learning. And this is a topic where she is recognized as a world expert. Uh, today, beyond hierarchical reinforcement learning, she has lots of different research interests in artificial intelligence, machine learning, reinforcement learning, but also reasoning and planning under uncertainty. Uh, so we are really thrilled to welcome Doina for this introduction to hierarchical reinforcement learning. Uh, Doina, you have the floor. Thanks again for being here. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I know that the school has only recently started, so I will try to uh, keep the presentation at the level of algorithms and ideas that I think you probably have seen already. Uh, but there might be a little bit of, of recent work that I cover as well, um, where perhaps I invite you also to revisit it uh, later on after the end of the school. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, to start by talking about one of the uh, big successes of reinforcement learning. This is the AlphaGo program that was developed at DeepMind in uh, 2016. Uh, there's recently been a five-year anniversary of this program. It's really a poster child for uh, reinforcement learning, which also leverages uh, deep learning architectures, uh, deep neural networks, uh, in order to learn how to play Go at the level that is comparable to the best uh, programs and people. Um, and so if we look uh, at, at how the problem is modeled here, we have uh, the program looking at the state of the board. That's the state, it's the perception. We have some actions which are legal moves. So each, uh, each available move will be considered an action. We have delayed rewards, which are plus or minus one at the end of the game. And the program is trained by playing games against itself. And the main advantage of, of training this program by reinforcement learning is that the program has the ability to experiment and as a result can invent new ways of playing, which, which seems superior. Now, what kind of knowledge that does this program have? Well, if we look at the, the details, there's really two different kinds of knowledge that this agent is acquiring. One of them is a policy that tells it what to do. So this models the probability of actions given the current state. So uh, from a more abstract point of view, we think of this as procedural knowledge, how to do things. Um, the value function, is uh, also present. The value function estimates the expected future return that the agent will get uh, from a particular board position given uh, the current choice of action that it has. Um, and so we can think of this as a form of predictive knowledge, specifically making predictions about the agent's return. And so one of the things that I want to talk about today is some ways of generalizing these ideas of a policy and a value function to be able to express more general forms of procedural knowledge and predictive knowledge um, in reinforcement learning agents. And the reason why, uh, why we want to do this is that really uh, I and many other people in the field actually think of reinforcement learning as a tool for building general uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, AI agents need to do many things. They need to be able to grow their knowledge and their ability to continually learn in their environment they might have limited data and they may need to reason at different levels of uh, temporal abstraction um, and of spatial abstraction in order to cope with new situations. And so cooking is one uh, activity actually that I always like to think about in this context because it's an activity that people find very uh, easy. Most people are able to cook at least some things, um, yet RL agents would find this very difficult. Okay, and part of the difficulty here is that there's many different levels of temporal reasoning that are required for these agents. 
Um, so an agent that's trying to cook dinner needs to make some high level decisions, for example, what recipe uh, it wants to make. Um, and then there's going to be so, some medium level decisions like what size of pot do we want and uh, you know, is, uh, is the stirring done? Uh, do we need to check the recipe perhaps as, as we go along. And then there's some low level motor skills that are necessary, right? Like moving the arm and the wrist uh, while, while stirring, for example. And all of these levels of reasoning and action need to be integrated. And people find no problem with this. And they also find no problem with reacting at the same time when something unexpected happens. Like, you know, if uh, a child walks into the room and knocks down uh, the pot, for example, we can interrupt, clean, clean the stuff up, and then continue with the activity. But in the uh, usual reinforcement learning framework, it's actually difficult uh, to interleave these levels of decision making. And so what I will talk about is hierarchical reinforcement learning, which is a collection of ideas and algorithms that are actually aiming to uh, be able to uh, sort of uh, use this process of interleaving decisions, reasoning, planning at multiple levels of, of abstraction. Now, temporal abstraction is not particular to reinforcement learning. It actually has a very long tradition in AI. Uh, in the 70s, people uh, built uh, temporally abstract planners that reasoned in terms of macro actions, that sequences, open loop sequences of actions. Um, and the advantage of doing that was shown uh, in terms of uh, both a computational complexity of uh, making decisions, uh, as well as the fact that the plans that come out are shorter, easier to interpret, um, and uh, we are able to solve uh, larger problems as a, as a side effect of this. Similar lines of work were present in robotics and hybrid systems where uh, controllers uh, provide similar benefits. One could, for example, trigger, trigger a, uh, a grasping controller in a robot, um, which may control uh, the robot's hand until the object is safely uh, in, in the hand and is, is stabilized. And so this is again, uh, in this context, a way to uh, both inject some prior knowledge about behaviors that perhaps could be learned in advance and validated, and also perhaps to improve uh, interpretability. So for example, one can look at what a uh, robot is, is doing and understand it from the point of view of executing these uh, high level behaviors. Now, why is temporal abstraction useful for uh, reinforcement learning, especially for complex RL tasks? We will talk a lot more about this and I will give some examples. But there's basically three categories of advantages. Uh, one is for planning, if we are indeed going to do planning using model-based reinforcement learning. Another category is to uh, learning, specifically in the context of exploration, we can travel in the environment in a more consistent way in larger steps. And we can leverage one stream of data that the agent might be experiencing in order to learn about many different things using off policy learning. And then finally, there are some advantages to interpretability. These are not uh, perhaps emphasized as much in the current literature, but hierarchical reinforcement learning reduces the problem size and focuses the attention uh, of, of the agent, perhaps on solving a subproblem, which might be uh, simpler to understand uh, and simpler uh, to analyze. And uh, also because we can inject some of this as prior knowledge, perhaps we can have uh, a model in which the agent uses uh, some knowledge that is, has already acquired and we understand that that knowledge works correctly. Maybe it's been uh, already validated. Um, now, how exactly do we uh, express abstract knowledge? I'm going to start by talking about procedural knowledge. So this is equivalent to policies or ways of behaving. Um, and I will talk about a framework called options, which are an expression of temporally abstract knowledge. Now, if you think about <clears throat> classical planning, or if you think about robotics, Options are a very natural generalization of both macro actions as well as uh, control policy. An option consists of three components. There's an initiation set of states where the option can start. You can think of this as a precondition for this option executing. Uh, 
there is an internal policy, which is denoted here pi omega. This uh, defines what the agent is doing in terms of primitive actions while this option is executing. And there is a termination condition beta omega, which gives us the probability of terminating the option upon entering uh, any state. So for example, if you consider a robot that might be navigating in the environment, if there's nothing in front of the robot, then the robot is able to move forward. So this is the uh, initiation set for the option of, of uh, the robot moving forward. The policy would just be a sequence of motor currents that control the robot to move forward. And if the robot gets too close to another object, then it may stop. And so this uh, defines the termination condition. Notice that both the policy and the termination condition uh, in general will be state dependent. Although a simple special case, it's to make them independent of the state. Uh, in this case, we end up, for example, with macro actions, like a sequence of actions that executes a fixed number of steps. So for example, go forward for five time steps. That's just a special case. Um, for the moment, I'm going to assume that the options are given, they are pre-specified. Um, and I'm going to discuss a little bit uh, later in about 15 minutes or so, what happens if we don't have a set of options to begin with. Now, what does decision-making with options look like? Well, at the top, you have a trajectory that one might see in a usual Markov decision process each of the little black dots is a state and the agent has a choice of action and one time unit ticks and afterwards the agent has a choice of action to make again. Um, there's a related formalism in operations research called semi-Markov decision processes. In a semi-Markov decision process, there are decision points, but they are not equally spaced in time. And so these sort of empty uh, white circles uh, show you these decision points. At the decision point, the agent uh, chooses what to do and then executes uh, that action. That action might take some random period of time uh, and then another decision point happens. What happens when we introduce options in a Markov decision process is that we actually induce a semi-Markov decision process. This is a result uh, that I showed uh, more than 20 years ago actually. Um, and it's it's now uh, well known and well understood. And so, uh, you know, you still have a mark of decision process that takes every time step, but decisions are actually uh, made only when an option terminates, okay? Um, and so now we have a semi-Markov process that gets overlaid, like in the bottom picture. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, what this means is that we can leverage all of the stuff that we know about learning and planning in Markov decision processes in order to learn and plan in a semi-Markov uh, decision process. So there's parallel algorithms to dynamic programming, Q-learning, TD-learning in the context of using options, and they look almost identical. And a lot of the theoretical results that are known from uh, usual reinforcement learning actually readily transfer in this context as well. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that we can think of options more generally as a form of behavior programs. Uh, what does this mean? Well, we can do uh, each option, uh, we can implement it as a little program and you can think of call and return execution essentially as using an execution stack. Um, and during the options execution, uh, it can look at certain variables. Think of that as being the state. And <clears throat> what it does is it emits actions. So that's its instruction. <coughs> and then we might have a termination condition. Uh, when it's reached, then the function uh, exits. <clears throat> now, once you start having this view of an option as a behavioral program, Actually, it's easy to notice that an option can also keep track of additional local variables. For example, it could be counting the number of steps that have elapsed since the option has started executing. And an option can also invoke other options. So even though in the literature, typically you see one layer of options overlaid on top of primitive actions, in fact, um, options uh, can also invoke other options, and this can be done in sort of uh, any uh, number of, um, of layers. 
and this is actually something that is would be quite interesting to to explore a little bit more in the future as <clears throat> it's uh, you know the, the existence of deeper hierarchies has not really proven beneficial to date in practice and we don't really understand exactly why if we take this view of an option as a behavioral program we can also do interruption so what does interruption mean it means that at every step one can check if there's some better alternative and if one has become available, we could switch to doing that. Um, and so one way to think about this is that it's there is a special uh, case of, of general concurrency. And in fact, other uh, models of concurrency might be available as well. So for example, if you have, let's say a robot where there's multiple joints, what could imagine independent options controlling these joints if they, these can really be controlled uh, independently and the framework allows for this as well. <clears throat> now, oftentimes we don't just want to use um, the policies themselves, but actually we want to uh, leverage them in order to do some planning, okay? And so the analogous thing in regular MDPs is that actions are associated with models. These models are reward and transition probability models. <clears throat> and uh, so similarly here, we're going to have models for options that consist of the reward expected until the option terminates and the, the transition probability to the next state. The only little quirk here is that we typically uh, take into account in this also the time elapsed. And so this is a direct consequence of thinking about the options inducing a semi-Markov process. In a semi-Markov process, we want to model both the state to which we transition as well as uh, the distribution of time. And so using the discount is the natural way to do this um, in the context of RL. So we can think of these models as predictions about the future. Um, and there's been some interesting work that shows that using them in order to do planning actually uh, results in further benefits compared to just using the options themselves. And so there's a little example here that came from the work of Matt Botvinnik and his collaborators. Um, and in this case, we have a little agent that's going around in a grid world. The grid world is the sort of form room environment that many people are using in order to illustrate hierarchical RL ideas. <clears throat> the agent is this little red square and it has to navigate to a goal position. In this case, the goal is this uh, green square here. And so uh, one thing that we can do is uh, use primitive actions and use a standard uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, in this case, Q-learning, and look at the agent's performance. This y-axis is steps to goal, so low is good. And the purple uh, line here shows the performance of the agent getting better over time. Um, as the agent is experiencing the environment. Now, imagine that somebody gave us some options and these options take the agent to these hallway states. The hallway states are interesting because they connect to different parts of the environment. And so an agent that can go to the hallway state can easily navigate from one room to the next. And so knowledge of policies that takes us to the hallway directly improves the exploration policy of the agent. So that's the line labeled hierarchical here. It shows us that if we have this knowledge, the agent is able to circulate more quickly around the environment and, uh, and therefore solve the task faster. <clears throat> now, what if instead of just using these options, we also learned some models for these options and did some planning on the side? In other words, use the model in order to reason, do some updates, extra updates to the value function. So what you see here is that actually the agent learns a much better policy and learns faster if we uh, use this approach. This is the blue line here. And intuitively, the reason for this is that instead of just getting benefits to the agent's exploration policy, we are now also getting some benefits to credit assignment, specifically because the model is temporally extended it can actually propagate the information back um, into to many states that are, uh, that are uh, along the way of an option. 
rather than just doing uh, error propagation over a single time step as in the case of uh, primitive action. This is a, another illustration of, of the same idea. Here we're looking at specifically as what happens if we do propagation of values just using single time step models in the top row and using temporally abstract models, models of options in the bottom row. So here we have a goal state that is placed in one of the hallways. And if we use single step models in order to propagate values, the value of this goal state spreads to neighboring states which are able to reach this goal. And so this is going to propagate first to the immediately neighboring states, then the states that are one time step further away and so on. And so in this particular case, uh, it would take roughly uh, 20 iterations in order for the value to propagate across the entire environment because, uh, you know, essentially that's the diameter uh, of the environment in terms of these primitive action steps. In the bottom row, we have options that uh, act in a room and take the agent to a hallway within that room. And we're also given the models for these options. These were pre-computed ahead of time. And so intuitively what's happening here is that the agent knows that from any state within a room, it can reach the hallway. And so any state within a room is within a temporally abstract step of, of the goal and one uh, pass, planning pass, associates values to all of these states. And so in just two iterations, all of, us, all of the states within the environment have associated values and they, they have a, a way of reaching the hallway. Um, so this is much faster. Of course, we have done some work ahead of time. We have learned the options and we have learned the models. And the performance of this kind of algorithm is really dependent on the quality of these options and models. So for example, if we had random options, maybe these kinds of um, advantages would not be quite as big. And so this is, this is important to keep in mind that we're essentially going to make a trade-off between the quality of the final solution the amount of time that we uh, we use ahead of solving any particular problem in order to acquire this knowledge <clears throat> and the final quality and the speed with which we obtain a solution for the final problem. <clears throat> uh, one thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, the result of planning with a set of options is an option value function. It's just like a, an action value function and you know, while these types of methods are called hierarchical reinforcement learning, there's really not exactly an explicit hierarchy here in the sense that we can interleave options and primitive actions, option models and primitive action models in exactly the same way, because all of the algorithms are fundamentally the same. <clears throat> we often want to leverage though some kind of information or prior data in order to be able to learn the options. And I will talk a little bit next uh, about how we can do that. Um, before I do this, are there any questions or comments so far? So th there are two questions which I haven't been able to directly answer in the in the Q&A, so I'll forward them to you now. I'm not sure they're directly related to what you've been talking about, so this is why I didn't interrupt. So Chair is actually asking, is there a way to represent options or temporally extended actions in a compact way so that we could take them as input for neural networks going from an equivalent of Q of SA to Q of SO, where O would be the option, of your, obviously, um, and in a non-trivial way, I mean, because other than just one hot encoding over options? Yeah, that is an excellent question. And uh, the answer is yes, this is possible, but you know, how to do it best is not yet known. So one way that people uh, have used is essentially, if we go back to, to this idea of having options that have a particular sub goal or, or terminate at some particular state, if you have an embedding for that state, then essentially you can characterize the option by its sub goal, by this sort of end state that it's trying to reach. And so this is an approach that's been used, for example, both in universal value function approximators, as well as in, in the case of goal conditioned policies. You can have an input to a network that has both the current state of the agent as well as the sub goal, 
uh, of the option that the agent is executing. And now we can, in fact, also generalize over these sub goals. Um, <clears throat> another way to do this that we've actually been exploring a little bit recently with my student, Jean Harp, is to try and embed a whole option rather than a sub goal, again, using a latent embedding. Uh, we have a paper online now called uh, Policy Value Networks, PVN, uh, where we discuss how to embed a policy into an embedding, essentially by doing some probing on the policy and understanding what it does. And that idea can also be used in the case of options. One can imagine taking an option, probing it to see what it would do in some key states, and then using those choices essentially as an embedding. We haven't played around very much with this approach, so I'm not sure exactly how well it works. Potentially, it is more general than just using the sub goal, but it's still an open question in some sense. Another question, maybe, um, which might actually be a transition to to where you're going now, is what what happens in environments where knowledge is not readily available um, as a decomposition or can't be provided to the agent, uh, as well, where a hard call or temporally abstract knowledge is not readily available. Yeah, this is a perfect segue, I think, into the next part of the talk. So we will talk about this next. OK, so so how should options be created? What if we don't have this knowledge ahead of time? Um, a lot of the time in practice, people have leveraged either prior information in the form of, let's say, uh, knowledge by a system designer or uh, people data. Right, so if you have human trajectories, for example, and you think they are following options, there are various methods for trying to infer the identity of, of those options uh, from this data, including, including um, hierarchical reps by Jan Peters group and a lot of recent work uh, from, uh, from the Berkeley group as well. If you have some knowledge about what are interesting states or sub goals, you can express this through a secondary reward structure that you apply and then we can learn options in this way. And so the options that I showed you before are actually learned based on this idea. And so for example, if you have an agent that is in a video game uh, and we are willing to provide this information, we could tell it that it's interesting, let's say to find objects or pick up objects in the game. This is sort of general knowledge that people would have from simply having played a lot of games. It's also possible for an agent to set up its own sub goals, right? To do intrinsic motivation essentially. And so, uh, you know, they, there's a very uh, nice set of papers actually in the literature um, on, on how to do this uh, as well. For example, from Pierre Houdet's group. Generally speaking, the question of what is a good set of sub goals or, or options is a question that is still very much open. And so I will show you some ideas of how to do this. Uh, but I think in general, this is uh, a discovery problem that is difficult, right? Sometimes Rich Sutton uses the, the world, carving the world at its joints, right? Finding where are these, uh, these connecting pieces. Um, and this is something that, uh, that is very important and we still have yet to really solve. One very strong intuition that actually came from this uh, example that I showed you, the room's example, is that there are some special states, I'm going to call these bottleneck states, that allow an agent to circulate between many different uh, parts of the environment. And so a lot of work has actually been put into using various methods like graph partitioning. More recently, we've done some work using graph neural networks, the graph Laplacian, and so on, uh, in order to identify these states. Most of these approaches are actually pretty expensive, both in terms of sample complexity as well as in terms of computation. However, uh, in people data from psychology experiments show that people do identify these bottleneck states, even in environments where we're not aware that these exist. For example, in, let's say, uh, Towers of Hanoi uh, kinds of problems where it's not immediately uh, clear if we plotted the graph of states, there are some bottleneck states and there's some psychological evidence that people uh, figure these out from, uh, from experience. Um, <clears throat> what else can we do? Well, one thing that is very simple and not perfect, but still useful is to use random sub goals. 
And so this was an approach that we tried a few years back with a work pioneered by Timothy Mann. Uh, here we have a continuous navigation task and we simply put some sub goals at random in the space. Uh, and then we have some options that uh, can navigate to these sub goals from a small vicinity around them, right? Think about it as you put some beacons and then a robot can navigate to the beacon if it's close enough to it, right? By a, a predefined policy. And we can of course learn uh, models that are associated with these. And in the LAVI, the picture that's labeled LAVI here, we show results of this kind of planning <clears throat> as compared to using primitive uh, action planning. Um, and here, even though we have uh, put in random sub goals, an agent is actually able to navigate reasonably well to a goal state after very little experience in, in the environment Whereas a primitive agent uh, doesn't know anything because it's barely been able to get out of the corner in which it started. Another idea is to simply use returns as an optimization objective to tell the agent it should optimize its expected return uh, and then use uh, existing RL ideas, for example, actor critic methods in order to, um, to obtain options that optimize return. So this is an approach that we've taken with Pierre-Luc Bacon and Jean Harb um, at McGill a few years ago. And it resulted in an algorithm called Option Critic. And here I'm showing you just some results to give you a flavor of what this algorithm does. So here we have the four rooms domain. Uh, the agent is rewarded for getting to a goal state. We have a discount factor. So the agent wants to get there as quickly as possible. And what we do is we have the agent learning the task. And then uh, in one case, it just uses primitive actions. In the other case, we tell the agent to use some number of options. So we only tell it this number. We don't tell it any other reward information or any other structure. Um, <clears throat> and But the agent knows that it has to acquire these options, including their internal policies and their termination conditions. And after a thousand episodes, we're going to move the goal state to a different position in this in this room that the agent is in. Um, and so what, what I'm showing here again is steps to goal. At the beginning, <clears throat> all of the agents, both those that are learning options, as well as those that are learning just a policy or a value function uh, are learning just about as quickly. Um, and then after a thousand episodes, we move the goal. At this point, all the agents are lost because where, where the reward was is no longer uh, accurate. Um, and then we look at how fast the agents are able to readapt uh, to this. And what we see here is that the flat agents, these are the red and the yellow curves, that one is actor critic, one is SARSA, take a very long time in order to reacquire this knowledge because their policy and the value function are expressed at this primitive level. The option agents are all better. Um, having more options helps, but only up to a point. So the, the lowest agents here have uh, six and eight options, but the, the agent that has four options does almost as well. Um, and so in this case, we can convince ourselves that even just using the reward for the task results in some interesting structure for the agent. And this is corro corroborated with uh, experiments in Atari games. These are four different Atari games. The green curve here is option critic, uh, which acquires value function, a policy, and a set of options all at the same time. Uh, the red line is uh, the DQN nature paper, which at the time of, of this work was the state of the art. And we can see that option critic uh, is able to acquire either uh, comparative or better policies uh, during this time, uh, which, is, which at the time was very surprising to me because options always required more data in order to train. Whereas here we were able to get really good results in an amount of data comparable to, to DQM. What kind of things are learned? So this is uh, an example here from the game of uh, Sequest where you have a little submarine, you're controlling the submarine and it has to sometimes go up to get air and sometimes it has to go down to rescue a diver. And we're learning two options in this case. 
that all white and black segments are showing you the time when a particular option is active. And so you can see that there is temporal abstraction happening an option is active for some period of time. <clears throat> and it turns out that these two options that are being learned, in fact, coincide with this behavior of going up to the surface or going down to the bottom of the river. This is not something that we pre-programmed. It was a side effect of training to optimize return. And so this goes back to, to the one of the advantages that I mentioned at the beginning, which is interpretability. We can obtain some of this uh, by, by these kinds of methods. There is one caveat to this particular work, which is that this kind of uh, option that optimizes return is going to inevitably shrink over time unless we do something to prevent this. Um, so let's think a little bit why this is. Well, we're dealing with a Markov decision process. We know that this process has an optimal policy which depends only on actions. And so <clears throat> in some sense, it's very natural that options would shrink over time because the best thing to do eventually is to revolve uh, around primitive actions only. Um, however, intuitively, we would like to keep the advantages of having longer options like speed of learning and speed of planning. Um, and so, you know, one way to, to think about achieving this is to put in a regularizer that prevents the shrinking of the options over time. Um, and here, one approach is to take inspiration from the idea of bounded rationality, which again is linked to uh, studies in psychology. Bounded rationality essentially says that reasoning about action choices is expensive because both it consumes energy, but also because there is a missed opportunity cost. So if you, know, if you have an animal that is sitting there thinking maybe a predator comes and eats it up, or maybe this animal is not able to eat its own food because it's just sitting there and thinking. And so uh, one way to uh, model this idea in our setup is to simply say that switching options incurs an additional cost. And uh, you know, one can actually phrase this uh, problem in a very natural way in a reinforcement learning setting by saying, we are not going to allow an option to terminate unless there is another alternative available that uh, has at least some predefined amount of improvement, right? So there is a margin between the value of the option that we're currently executing and an alternative, and that margin now becomes a hyperparameter, um, a threshold that, that we can use. And so this is just an illustration of what happens if we use this idea, um, which by the way, is very easy to, to implement. Um, and so the middle graph here shows you these options that are trained by penalizing for switching. The leftmost graph shows what happens if we don't have this deliberation cost. And you can see that the options are shrinking into these very little uh, colorful segments. In the middle graph, the options stay extended. And the more interesting thing is that where they decide to terminate, which are these little green arrows in the, in the uh, other graph, um, these are states where either the agent is at an intersection and so it has the opportunity to switch direction of its movement, or there's a little area here at the top of the graph where in this particular game, there's a monster that can come and eat you. And so the optimal thing to do if you see the monster is actually to switch direction. And so a lot of the termination that's being learned happens there. So the deliberation cost prevents these options from becoming too short and the terminations that result are actually also quite intuitive. Now, this begs the question of whether all option components should actually optimize the same criterion. Um, in particular, the deliberation cost can be viewed as a criterion that is associated specifically with the termination rather than with the trajectory of the option. Um, and so one approach that one can think of is to optimize rewards in the internal policy of the option, but have a separate specified uh, criterion that the termination uh, should optimize. And so we've explored this idea with my collaborators at DeepMind uh, in this paper called Termination Critic that was uh, spearheaded by Anna Haritunian. Um, in this case, we uh, use a notion of predictability 
um, as the uh, criterion for uh, the termination condition. In other words, we would like options that end up in a predictable way, right? Whose model is peaked. This is a similar idea to this idea of bottlenecks or, or funneling states. Um, and the side effect that, that we obtain with these kinds of options is that also uh, the model of these options is quasi deterministic. And so we can in fact use expectation models without uh, worrying too much instead of using full distributional model. And so there's different ways to express this predictability criterion. One way that we explored is just to minimize the entropy of the transition model of the option. Uh, and this is just some sample results to give you a taste of what this does. Uh, we have here on, on the A2OC graphs, some termination conditions that are learned in four rooms uh, just by optimizing for returns. The other graphs are showing termination conditions that are being learned by using predictability. And what you can see is that the agent is learning options that typically end in a small region of state space. And this gives some improvement in terms of uh, the options uh, performance. Uh, notice that the goal was not to improve performance really, uh, but, but still we get this as a sort of nice side effect. So, this is the, these are the kinds of ideas that we can use in order to learn options. I'll pause there for a minute and see if there are any more questions. Um, thanks, Dolina. There, well, actually, questions keep popping up right now. <laughs> uh, so there was one uh, longstanding question here. Um, Yakin was asking, is there any relation between options and the disturbance random parameter uh, with um, within dynamic programming literature. Okay, sorry, maybe I did not pass that correctly. Is there any um, relation between options and the disturbance random parameter within the dynamic programming literature? I just read it as- I am point. not aware of a relationship, but that's an interesting thought. So maybe I should be thinking about this. I'm not aware of it. Um, there is a question. C could you please uh, get back to how, what, what really is the objective function for, well, discovering options either in the option critic or in the termination critic uh, cases or other yes. cases actually in her morality? So, so in option critic, we simply optimize return. So the criterion for that we're optimizing is the same as in regular reinforcement learning. We want to max the expected return. Um, in the, you know, the, the intermediate step here, we are going to add a penalty for switching options. And this penalty is just fixed. We pick a number. Um, and so, so now this becomes the optimization criterion. And in termination critic, we have two optimizations going on at the same time. There's one optimization for the termination condition, which is parameterized and then a separate uh, optimization for the internal policy. The internal policy still optimizes for return, but the termination condition optimizes for some other criterion. In the paper, we actually have a general theorem that can be applied, you know, that takes it as input a criterion and then provides the, the algorithm that corresponds to it. The algorithm that we've experimented this with is this minimizing the entropy of the option transition model um, but I can imagine other criteria being used there that the theorem holds as, you know, it's a general policy gradient theorem, basically. And so, you know, the, the main idea is you treat termination as an action. It's a, you know, I either stop or I go. So now I have, you know, a policy that needs to make a choice here. And if we have a policy gradient style theorem, we can build reinforcement learning algorithms around that. Sure. Um, th there are two questions that just popped up that are kind of related together, so I'll just uh, pass them on both at once. So the first question is, couldn't the problem of shrinking options be addressed by saying that past behaviors must be compressed to fit in the memory of the agent so that trajectories represented by options with, um, with naturally lower entropy are better compared with trajectories represented by primitive actions? So that, that's the first one. The, the second one is sort of related, um, not exactly. Um, and it, it was stating uh, the question, can entropy maximization help finding options that are similar to what we do to encourage exploration? Not exactly yes. the same topic, but it's sort of related. 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so so these are these are both great questions and yes, indeed somewhat related. In terms of op options that are useful for exploration, there has been this paper called Diversity is All You Need uh, that that argues that that this should be uh you know the, the main idea is to have options that circulate around the environment and similarly there has been work that tries to combine the idea of compression or predictability with option discovery um and so tejas kukarni for example has done some interesting work uh in in this respect uh there are some pitfalls uh, around around these ideas, and so I'll I'll say uh, a little bit of that. In terms of optimizing for for entropic options, actually one of the problems is that this uh, may result in a lot of useless options. And if one tries to improve predictability, and the predictability takes into account trajectories, there's also a pathological behavior, which is that the agent learns to do some little dances. That are options they're very predictable because they're always the same uh, but they're not useful and so this is the reason why we always still need to be grounded in rewards because otherwise you might be learning something that doesn't actually have a, a direct impact on returns it's just a you know it's something that the agent can do uh, but it doesn't have utility um, I think there is a lot of potential in the idea of thinking more broadly about compression in the context of options so specifically, um, if you imagine that the options define a semi-MDP, right? This is an abstract problem. And now we're solving this, this abstract problem. There is, uh, you know, so now you have a compression into this higher level. That compression ha comes at the cost of a loss because the solution that we're going to compute there is not quite as good. And one can explicitly reason about the trade-off between these, this loss and uh, you know, how much benefit we're getting from the computational savings and the memory savings. Now, how to do this in a nice online incremental way is the challenge, right? Because a lot of these algorithms actually look at the batch of data, they do the compression using a batch, and uh, the batch is gathered with respect to a policy. So this is the challenge in reinforcement learning. So if I change the policy, the batch may look different. And so I think there is a really interesting research opportunity, in fact, in this idea of thinking how to do online compression when the distribution of the data that you're compressing is also shifting over time. And there may be some opportunities, for example, to do things like progress and compress uh, in that space uh, for people who are familiar more with the deep learning literature, but it, it's not been explored, I think, sufficiently. Um, lots of questions are popping up faster than I can actually transmit them to you. Maybe you'll want to move forward a little bit okay. and we'll get yeah. back to questions afterwards. Sounds good. Um, okay, so now I also want to talk a little bit about uh, abstract predictive knowledge because uh, we've talked about procedural knowledge quite a bit, right? This is these options. But what about predictive knowledge? And I just want to remind you that in usual reinforcement learning, predictive knowledge is typically expressed as a value function. Value function is the expectation of the discounted uh, return. Um, and so I'm just writing it out here. This is the traditional Sutton and Barto uh, value function for a given policy pi, mapping from states to actions. And so there's two, two uh, important elements here that I want to emphasize. One is there's a signal of interest, right? So in this case, the reward is the signal of interest that we're trying to predict. And then there's a time scale over which we want to make this prediction. This is gamma here, it's a number between zero and one. And of course we can define an optimal value function and a lot of RL is centered around computing this optimal value function that would maximize V over the space of policy. Okay, so why do we like value functions? Well, it's really for, for computational reasons. They allow us to use bootstrapping algorithms that piggyback on dynamic programming, but they're approximate dynamic programming algorithms. And also we can use sampling. And so we have very good ways of estimating value functions. Um, but you know, people crit who criticize reinforcement learning say, well, value functions are just about the reward. There's so many other things that an agent might want to predict, right? Maybe it wants to predict future states. 
Maybe it is interested in some particular variables. Maybe it wants to make predictions over multiple time horizons, right? Some short-term predictions, some longer-term predictions, and so on. Um, and so this is just an illustration of this idea taken from Adam White's uh, thesis, uh, where he had a robot and he was doing predictions about many different sensory observations of the robot over different uh, periods of time and using different ways of behaving. For example, random policy or following a wall or just doing some kind of Brownian motion for the robot. So how do we generate temporally abstract predictions? This is the idea of general value functions, which we introduced in 2011 in this Horde architecture paper, uh, but it's actually been explored uh, quite a bit since, including we've done some recent work on this idea. And so here, what we're gonna do is use value functions, but just generalize them to allow more general signals of interest and also more uh, expressivity in the time scale. <clears throat> So what does more, uh, more signals of interest mean? We're gonna still use here C, we're, I'm gonna call this a cumulant. It's a signal that depends on the state, the action and the next state in the more general case. Um, but instead of just being a number like the reward, it can be anything, it can be a vector or, or even a matrix. And we're going to accumulate this over time, okay? Now, how do we ex explain the time scale to the agent? Well, we're gonna use a continuation function gamma here which is dependent on state. And so at every state, the agent can decide whether it's interested in continuing with this prediction or whether it wants to stop predicting this particular cumulant and, and focus on something else. Um, and so this is what a general value function is. It's like a value function, but it predicts for some specific signal C and some specific function gamma that may depend on state. And obviously fixed discounts are a special case of this. And so instead of having this value function parameterized by a policy, we're gonna think of it as being parameterized by a policy, a cumulant and a continuation function. Um, and so, you know, if you want to think about this, you know, you're gonna have these value functions that, that take as input the cumulant or the reward in some sense, right? The continuation and the policy, they also take as input a state and they generate an estimate. And now if you think of these as like Lego blocks, you can imagine actually uh, piecing these together and stacking them in various ways. So for example, we could use the output of a GVF as uh, the cumulant for another GVF, right? Or we might be able to uh, provide a different discount or a different time scale that comes from some GVF. And so there's many different ways of combining these, uh, these GVFs as blocks of knowledge. And one particular case that's kind of interesting to think about is successor states and successor features. I'll talk a little bit more about this. Also option models, as it turns out, are general value functions. We can identify the reward as being one particular uh, sort of uh, thing of interest here in the reward model. And the continuation is in this case state dependent because an agent continues if the environment allows it to continue according to gamma and if the option uh, allows it to continue uh, according to its continuation probability. And there's actually many other approaches that, that can be expressed as GVFs. And we can ask this question of whether GVFs are just an interesting insight or they can actually be useful for something. And so I'll show you one idea for using GVFs that, that's interesting to consider. We've explored this in a New Europe's uh, 2019 paper and we actually have a bigger PNAS paper uh, on the same topic. So here's the intuition. Imagine that you have an agent that's trying to uh, make some music, okay? And so this agent has learned options for pressing individual keys, right? So now if I had a policy over options, this policy could play notes, so it could play a melody, uh, but it can't play chords, right? Because I, you know, it calls options one at a time. And so that generates one key. What if we wanted to play chords? Okay. Well, one way to express this is to say you're interested in multiples of these keys at the same time. Okay. And so a cumulant that we're interested in here is actually a linear combination of individual cumulus that say maximize tapping on a particular key. And we've developed uh, sort of a general approach based on policy evaluation and policy iteration 
that is able to take such a cumulant and actually generate a policy. And unfortunately, I won't be able due to time limitations to explain all of this, but I will show you some results that give the intuition of what's going to happen here. So I'll skip the actual method. Uh, <clears throat> but I just want to, uh, to give you the intuition. So here we have an agent that has uh, two policies, OK? One policy that has been uh, trained uh, in order to maximize red. And so it wants to go to red objects as this red policy here. There's also a policy that's been trained to maximize blue objects. That's pi 2, OK? And now we can express to the agent something like, you should maximize red while also minimizing blue, OK? Notice that the first policy that we had is actually not good for this purpose, because there's a blue object on the agent's trajectory. And so the object this object is going to be bumped by the agent. But using this approach, the agent can actually synthesize a third way of behaving, this pi 3 here, that goes to a, an area of red objects while also avoiding blue objects. And <clears throat> I'm going to show you this here as well in a different application called the moving target arena. So here we have a robot that's in this uh, sort of circular uh, room. Um, the robot has learned to navigate in three directions that are denoted by the black lines. And so it has three options for going in these three directions. But we can actually obtain any direction in this room by using a, a linear weighting over these options that basically says you want to go in some particular direction and you want to avoid some other direction. And so we're showing here some results of, of this idea the grayed out part at the beginning of this graph is the training part. So the agent in this time is simply training. Um, the red curve here is a usual DDPG agent. So, you know, usual policy gradient. The green curve is using only the options that are being used in call and return fashion. So we can call an option and that option is gonna sort of drive the agent for some time. And because we have three options, we can uh, have the agent sort of zigzagging around in this environment, but it's gonna always have to do either one or the other of these trajectories. The other curves on top are all using this player agent that can play uh, multiple options at the same time and mediates about, uh, uh, their, their suggestions for primitive actions by using this idea of generalized value functions. And so you can see that in this case, we achieve a very fast computation while also achieving very good quality. And the intuition here is that really the general value function information is much richer and doing policy improvement on top of that actually allows the agent to consider uh, many more choices of policies. And so the policy class is not limited anymore to the policy class defined by the options. It's actually much larger. And so I want that to talk about affordances. Um, but I just wanted to um, to tell you a little bit, you know, to sort of conclude and, and also mention one other uh, problem which I consider to be quite important in this space. So just to conclude, I think temporal abstraction gives us a very interesting way of thinking about uh, general AI agents that are built with reinforcement learning. And one direction that I'm very interested in is this idea of continual or lifelong learning. So reinforcement learning agents that not, don't just learn to solve one task, but that exist in an environment for a very long period of time and can track changes in that environment. Notice that this goes beyond the usual Markov decision process framework, because now the reward function, the transitions might, might change over time. And one of the interesting questions becomes, how, are, how should we actually evaluate empirically uh, these lifelong learning AIs? And if there is not just a single task, then understanding the behavior becomes even more important. And so this is a question of what is the right methodology to do this? And so one interesting uh, thing that we've been exploring is this idea of testing the agent in multiple ways. So think about school, right? You have agents that are going their training day to day, uh, but then they're, they're, they're going through some tests and these tests might be devised to certify specific capabilities in an agent. Like, you know, does the agent know to multiply numbers, for example? Um, and this kind of certification may actually be quite important for the future, uh, perhaps more important than other uh, approaches uh, in terms of interpretability of deep neural networks, for example, 
um, which rather than trying to assess capabilities are trying to understand at the very micro level what is being learned in, in the network uh, links. And I think temporal abstraction uh, can have an important role to play here. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to take more questions. Thanks a million, Doina. Um, we're, well, time is almost over, but I, I vote we, we take a couple of minutes still uh, for, for questions. There are currently four questions on the Q&A and I'm running late on them because I haven't read them. Uh, so let me just pass them to you. Um, there's actually five questions now. <laughs> could, um, so could general value functions be used as a predictive approach to the problem of perception? For example, one could say that objects are characterized by what can be expected to be seen when we move our, our eyes over them, or depth could be seen as how much free space is in front of us. Uh, we have to advance before we hit a wall. Wait, that didn't, that last sentence didn't make sense. Uh, let me get back to it. Or depth could be seen as how much free space is in front of us when we have to advance before we hit a wall. Absolutely. So, I, and I think this is, uh, this is an aspect of general value functions, which is quite important. And we should really take seriously that they can be the way in which we interpret perception. This would take us back to more active forms of perception because now we are dependent on actually doing something in the environment. But I think this would help us to learn some representations that are both more useful for action choices, right, for decision making, and also representations that perhaps generalize in more interesting ways uh, than current sort of supervised or, or unsupervised learning. Um, sort of related, uh, there is a question I believe is useful for the audience in general. So the key innovation of the hierarchical reinforcement learning is to extend the set of available actions so that the agent can now choose to perform not only elementary actions, but also macro actions. It is sequences of lower level actions. Hence, what actions, uh, well, sorry, hence, with actions that are extended over time, we must consider the time elapsed between decision-making moments. Is it easy to extend MDPs to accommodate uh, HRL? Uh, higher reinforcement learning. Yeah, so semi-MDPs are basically the right way to accommodate uh, to accommodate this framework, uh, and you know that's that makes it the easiest. There have been other approaches as well. So, for example, one might imagine you know again mapping into an abstract MDP where we don't care about the time scale at all, but we just consider transitions between these abstract states at the ends of options. There is uh, advantages. Uh, and disadvantages to doing that. The advantage is that <coughs> it's actually easier to deal with an abstract MDP because we don't have to care about the discount. But the disadvantage is that we might compute a policy that is um, a lot worse or possibly a policy that can't actually be implemented in the lower level MDP. So for example, if I don't take, you know, if you imagine a car that's breaking, time estimates of whether you're gonna hit or not are quite important. And so, uh, you know, dealing with an with a the abstraction that doesn't take time into account can be pretty dangerous. Okay, one last question. I'm going to pick it among the six remaining ones. <laughs> um, oh yes, this one is such a hierarchical reinforcement learning setup adapted to language modeling. Given that we can set different intuitive levels of abstraction, a level of words, sentences, documents, and so on. Uh, absolutely. I think there are some really interesting parallels and uh, this hasn't really been explored very much in the context of NLP, but the structure of the, the solution space is very much uh, compatible with NLP and some of the methodologies that have been used are also compatible. So for example, in NLP, sometimes we use hierarchical RNNs and so hierarchical RNN can very nicely be combined with an HRL agent that takes actions, uh, you know, as a function of these hierarchical states. And in the context of dialogue systems, for example, this would be quite a cool idea to explore. 